Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I'm uh, Joe Gray. Uh, we're going to be talking, I'm sorry about that, uh, from CTF to CVE. Basically, I'm going to share um, my thoughts on CTFs and where the value uh, in CTFs uh, lie, and then uh, share with you a story of how I actually got my first and currently only CVE from uh, working through uh, things sim not uh, dissimilar to what you may see on uh, bug bounties or uh, just out in the wild and have to coordinate. So uh, to get started, um, I'm the 2017 DerbyCon Social Engineering Capture the Flag winner. Uh, my team got third place in the OSINT CTF at NOLACON last year. Uh, we're coming back uh, this year and we're out for blood. Um, I'm the co-founder of Through the Hacking Glass uh, Mentorship Project. Uh, we are working on getting uh, everything up and running for that. Uh, I'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. Uh, I'm a Forbes contributor and I'm in the process of authoring, uh, despite my poor grammar, that's why we have editors, uh, a social engineering and OSINT book with No Starch Press. and um, you may be aware of my blog and now pretty much defunct podcast at advancedpersistentsecurity.net. Um, on the topic of CTFs, here's some stuff from the DerbyCon uh, SCCTF. Uh, I forgot to put the picture of my black badge into the slide deck, but uh, if you go looking on Twitter, uh, especially with DerbyCon being a hot topic right now, I think Kate Brew uh, shared a picture of it. Uh, this is from NOLACON. Same thing. Um, so if you see the password inspection agency about, you'll know who it is. So uh, the objectives and flow of this presentation, uh, basically I wanna talk about types of CTF, uh, where you might get CTFs, some of the common themes, tools of the trade. Um, and then of course there are pros and cons. You're going to have some people who just have to be uh, 1337 all over everything. And they, they just, there is no CTF that's good enough for them or you have people who uh, on the opposite side of the coin uh, can absolutely step in and demolish anyone in any CTF, but can't hack their way out of a wet paper bag. Um, then we're going to talk about finding a bug and responsible disclosure. So, oops, sorry. Um, before we get started, quick definitions. Uh, red team, basically that's the adversarial emulation team. Uh, basically they are posing as the bad guys. Uh, they may be the bad guy. You may have what I call an unauthorized pen test or an unauthorized red team engagement. And that's where you're going to have people helping you out with that, uh, that you don't necessarily want their help. Uh, blue team, that's basically any defensive body. Uh, it could even uh, get into policy procedure and senior management, but some people say that may be the green team or the gold team. I don't really want to get into more colored teams that if I don't have to. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, security as a whole, we are rainbow team, like it or not. Uh, and honestly, with red team, I'm kind of against the use of the term red team because at the end of the day, if you're not a criminal and you're not doing something out of malice, you're going to produce a report and turn it over to uh, your client and they are going to take action in theory, I understand some won't, uh, to actually improve their security. So in, in fact, you are posing as red, but you're really working on the blue team. Uh, purple team engagements, that's any sort of collaboration between red and blue. It may have a red teamer sitting right beside a blue teamer working in a SOC and they're saying something to the effect of, okay, I'm uh, right at your web server. I found this cross-site scripting bug. I'm going to exploit it. Let me know if you see anything. And basically they work through various attack scenarios to determine what uh, specific events uh, or behavior is observed during those types of things. Uh, getting into the hats, white hat, black hat, gray hat. This is a reference to the old cowboy movies uh, where the bad guys always wore black hats and the good guys always wore white hats. Uh, basically uh, that's the same uh, within industry. And then you have gray hats, which uh, are, Typically, someone who is good most of the time who does some things bad or vice versa. Um, an example of some gray hat activity may, uh, depending on your views and opinions, might be anonymous whenever they decided they were going to take on the KKK, while what they, was, what they were doing was illegal. Uh, it was seen as for the greater good of, of people. Um, then we've got Red Hat and Blue Hat. I put those as jokes. Red Hat, of course, is the Linux operating system, and Blue Hat is a Microsoft conference, um, just to keep going with all of the uh, colors. 
So about CTFs, uh, we have various types. Uh, you may have uh, one that's self-contained in a virtual machine, or it may be uh, a puzzle. Uh, think of this last year's DEF CON badge. Uh, if you went and was able to link your DEF CON badge with one of each of the other types of DEF CON badges, whether it be goon, speaker, organizer, volunteer, um, press, whatever, uh, it, it opened up other things. Um, you could have a network or web-based um, network king of the hill, uh, which is very popular uh, with DEF CON 404 in Atlanta. Uh, they tend to run one, I would say, at least three to five times a year. Um, my personal favorites, uh, social engineering capture the flag and uh, OSINT capture the flag, which includes the missing persons CTF uh, that uh, Robert Sell and Trace Labs runs. I think they're getting ready to run a global missing person CTF. So if you want to dig into the OSINT, that's a good place to do it. Um, then you might have hackathons, which they're not really a CTF, but sometimes they are. Um, occasionally you'll see a DFIR digital forensics and incident response uh, CTF where you may be tasked with solving uh, memory forensics challenges, disk forensic challenges, uh, possibly even uh, network forensic stuff. You may be tasked with reverse engineering a piece of malware and providing indicators of compromise, or they may just put you in front of something like Splunk and say, have at it, detect what's going on. Uh, and from that same vein, pros versus Joes, typically those will include uh, four teams, two sets of pros and two sets of Joes, one red pro and one uh, red Joe and one blue pro and one blue Joe. And basically the two teams compete against each other. So the red pros will attempt to uh, compromise the blue Joe, the red pros will compromise the blue Joes and vice versa. Um, starting to get very confusing with that terminology, but basically it's allowing people who don't necessarily work in a SOC or are not necessarily a pen tester to be able to test their skill against someone who is uh, someone on the opposite side of the coin. So where can you find CTFs? Conferences, that's pretty common. Um, if you win uh, the DEF CON CTF, uh, you get a black badge, and that's applicable to uh, the network CTF as well as other ones like the social engineering CTF. Um, as an example, um, my Derby Cod black badge, which I hope another conference picks up the black badge uh, thing from DerbyCon. Just kidding. Maybe not. Uh, Volnhub is a good place. Hack the box, root me, over the wire, CTF365. And it's sometimes Google or other companies, Cisco, Google, whomever, they may run a CTF. Your local DEF CON groups run a CTF. Uh, OpenSock has a CTF. Um, so for example, I'm one of the co-organizers of DC865 and we try to run one or two CTFs for the chapter every year. Uh, we also assist with building the CTF for B-Sides Knoxville. And last year, uh, a few of us actually put together a CTF and went and helped out the uh, cybersecurity club at Montreat College. So uh, lots of stuff with that. So commonalities. You're probably going to find some garbage software on there. And I'm not saying that the software itself is garbage, but it's going to be configured like garbage. Uh, very typically, you might see WordPress, Drupal, or Joomla because they're relatively fast and easy to set up. They're not that uncommon in the real world. And if you know what you're doing, it's really not hard to blow through it. Uh, you typically find weak passwords, uh, unless we're talking like the DEF CON uh, password hacking challenge. Uh, you'll typically find passwords included from places like uh, the john.txt file, rocku.txt, top 500 uh, poor passwords uh, file, things like that. You'll find poor configurations, um, which in the real world, you would think they aren't really that bad, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, you might find something where um, it allows you to, or allows root login via secure shell, or you have a secure shell key, but you're able to also crack the password. Uh, or it could be something, um, like comments in the source code of a website. That's something very common. And that actually paid uh, dividends in the uh, SCCTF this last year for me because I was able to find some fun stuff that I'll tell you about a little bit later. Uh, you do commonly find insecure protocols like FTP, Telnet, the such. 
I would like to say that they you don't see that in the wild, but I mean, the protocols are still around for a reason. Uh, you'll typically see web applications. And then a lot of times, especially when you're dealing with something like hack the box, you'll see named vulnerabilities like a dirty cow or Kerberos or something like that. And they'll typically with those types of boxes, um, and I've not taken OSCP, I've not taken the pen testing with Cali course, so I can't speak directly to the labs there, but I've been told that the lab, the machine names in the lab are also kind of hints at what you're actually after, which we could say doesn't happen in the real world, but then whenever you see uh, a host that we'll say is Acme org, um, you know, the domain would be acme.org and we see uh, ad1.acme.org. Well, it's a pretty good guess that that's Active Directory. And we could do the same thing with anything else. Um, there's quite uh, often crypto involved, and that's going to eat up a lot of people's time because a lot of people aren't as familiar with crypto as others. Uh, so that, that's always uh, an option as well. Uh, steganography, uh, you'll see that especially in like uh, forensic challenges. Uh, but occasionally you'll see it in a regular CTF as well, where someone's trying to hide something like, say, a picture or some text within a picture or something to that na uh, of that nature. Same thing with packet captures. So within these specialized CTFs, we, we understand that with a, a conventional network or VM-based CTF that you're basically trying to compromise that host or series of hosts. So in doing so, we have to look at it from a different lens for other types of CTF. So with, o with an OSINT CTF, you may have predetermined targets, and most often you will. And with that, um, for like Chris Silvers, his OSINT CTF, he takes volunteers from the conference, whether it be goons, volunteers, uh, speakers, or other people, and he'll, collect, he'll ask for, I believe, about five to ten pieces of information on each. And then the teams just go and they look for it and they submit the flag, but then they could also be solicited for a link to that. Because with the OSINT, you're not, you're not interacting with these people at all. You're basically seeing what you can find on the internet for free. Uh, and then the, uh, sometimes you collect flags on the companies and sometimes the people of the company within the SECTF, which you'll be for that scenario about, uh, six to eight weeks out from either DerbyCon or DEF CON, the competitors are selected uh, because you do have to apply for it. And then you are assigned a target company. You have three to four weeks to complete the initial OSINT phase and collect those 35 flags. You produce a cohesive report and you submit it for scoring. And then the part of the SECTF that everybody knows about would be the day of the event when you're actually in the booth making phone calls, doing vishing, to your target company. Uh, keep in mind, you're not allowed to make contact with anyone in the company leading up to that. Uh, you can call to verify the number is live, but that's it. Um, so with the OSINT CTF, with the way Chris Silvers does it, everybody's looking for the same exact flags on the same exact targets. Uh, in social engineering, everybody's calling at different times and they all have a different target. Uh, for example, this last year at DEF CON, my SECTF slot was Saturday at 1.30, and that was Saturday at 3.30 local time for my target company. So it was a lot harder for me to get someone to answer the phone than the people who were calling at the same time on Friday, uh, the same perceived local time to their target on Friday. Um, that's why I'm happy to hear that for DEF CON 27, the SECTF is going to be on Thursday, Friday. It's going to even the playing field a little bit more. Uh, DFIR is, like I said, you may conduct forensics and analysis on files provided by hacking in. You may be trying to reconstruct what's going on, build a timeline uh, or anything. And same thing, pros and Joes. So typical tools of the trade. Uh, of course, there's Kali. Uh, you may decide to use Parrot. You might want to use Black Arch. Uh, you could use anything really. Um, I know some OSINT CTFs like the one Snow ran at HackWest last year, the winning team actually used their cell phones. They didn't even touch a computer. Um, so tools that I've mentioned here, uh, all these things are contained within Kali. So if you use that, you're good. But there are times that you don't want to use Kali. Like, for example, when I'm doing certain types of OSINT uh, leading into um, a social engineering engagement or a capture the flag, 
I have a uh, VPS hanging out in the cloud that has all the tools that I want to use on it and I connect from there. And the beautiful thing is I actually have a backup of that so I can actually use once and destroy so I don't have to worry about A, cross-contaminating OSINT from one company with OSINT for another company, but I'm also uh, able to get a new IP address every time and avoid uh, getting put in threat intelligence feeds if the company is proactive enough to catch me. So with these, uh, WP scan, that's a WordPress uh, scanning and enumeration tool. Uh, you can use it to uh, even conduct password cracking with it. Uh, Burp Sweep is probably one of the most important ones, in my opinion. I would say it and Wireshark are probably the two most important on this uh, screen. Uh, Burp Suite being a uh, web proxy that you're able to funnel all your traffic through and you're able to inspect uh, the requests and the fields associated with it. Uh, you'll see this, the outcome of some of the stuff from Burp Suite uh, whenever I talk about my CVE. And for a lot of the things that you would be doing, especially with like Bug Crowd or Hacker One or another uh, bug bounty type of thing, uh, a lot of it's going to be web-based. Uh, of course, there are some th sometimes some um, companies ask for analysis of their Android application or uh, an iOS application or something, and they'll give you the source code or the APK, and then you use your uh, integrated development environment IDE for that. Um, but for web things, Burp Suite is probably your best friend. Um, Nmap, it's old reliable. Network Mapper, it's going to tell you what ports and protocols are running. Uh, you can go a lot deeper than just port scanning with it. If you get into the Nmap scripting engine, then you can start dealing with things like uh, ascertaining the version of things and testing for known vulnerabilities. You can even write your own. So in some ways, Nmap is actually more like Metasploit than it is like Nessus. Uh, the next one is Metasploit. Uh, because of OSCP and the fact you're only allowed to use Metasploit once in OSCP, uh, through all of my offensive research and whenever I'm mentoring other people, I try to encourage them to avoid using Metasploit if at all possible. Uh, of course, if you're doing this in a professional environment and you are allowed two hours of time to conduct the test and write the report, it may be practical for your time to do that. Armitage, uh, which is the next logo, uh, second from the left on the bottom, uh, that's basically a GUI wrapper for Metasploit. Wireshark, that's going to be your packet sniffer. Uh, you're going to be able to uh, look at unencrypted packets and gather data from that. Uh, if it is encrypted, there are ways that you could uh, ascertain that information, but it's a fairly complicated process and above the, uh, above the scope of what I'm looking to uh, attain with this. NCRAC, it's just like Medusa or um, Hydra, you can use it for on the wire password cracking. It's part of the Nmap project. Uh, in some ways, it's more efficient than the others. In other ways, it's a little bit uh, clankier than the others, but it's still an alternative that's worth um, worth examining and getting some familiarity with. Uh, I certainly, I enjoy using it uh, when appropriate. So about the whole argument with the uh, uh, CTFs not being realistic. I'm not gonna lie to you, sometimes CTFs aren't. Um, you may not encounter that same type of format in the real world. I mean, when you're, when you're doing a professional pen test, the probability of you cracking the domain admin password using Mimikatz after exploiting Eternal Blue it, and the password being flag curly bracket, some punny phrase end curly bracket is pretty low. I'm not saying that there aren't domain admin passwords like that, but more than likely they're not going to be that way. But the thing is, the the concepts that you're putting out there and the concepts that you're doing within CTFs, uh, they are effective in the real world because it's going to stimulate creativity. If it hadn't been for me doing CTFs and looking at the source of the uh, websites that I was on, uh, looking for hints and looking for other websites to pivot to, I would have never found uh, some stuff. Um, and right here is just an example. Um, this is from the SECTF, so I'm not going to say who it is. But what we can see here, um, and you guys are actually in an advantage as opposed to uh, 
if this were presented at a conference in front of a large audience on a projector because your screens are actually small enough to where you can read what this is talking about. But basically what this is, is it's a hard-coded pop-up that's giving the recipes for the username and password of users. So if I wanted to be a quote unquote employee of this company, I can go to LinkedIn, find out who it is. Oh, they work in the office. So, okay, I can guess that. And then, okay, there's how you change it. Uh, oh, I'm a shop employee. Okay, well, if I wanna call and fish them for this, okay, well, uh, I need to confirm your maintenance, te maintenance tech, uh, technician number. And then all of that stuff. And then it's not hard to get the other stuff, but the, the point being that this is actually in the source code of this company's website. And as you can tell, I've censored uh, as much as I can tell out of here. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is just one example. So uh, some people say they're just too vulnerable. Well, you could be right. But uh, anyone who has a Twitter account, uh, anyone who follows anything InfoSec, uh, or honestly just watches the mainstream news anymore, uh, knows how often uh, organizations are breached. And that tells us that vulnerability management is lacking because with almost every breach we can see, uh, we, we hear someone talking, whether it be um, Patrick Gray or Troy Hunt or any of the people here locally, it could be Graham Cluley in the UK, um, Brian Krebs, I mean, Jason Street used the term, Brian Krebs should not be your IDS. I cannot agree more, uh, but point being, uh, reading their blogs or listening to their podcasts or what have you, um, we can always get to the bottom of things for the most part. So like, for example, the Equifax problem was because of a struts vulnerability that had been released uh, and it was outside the, nine, the 30 day window for getting it patched. So that was just one example. And the thing is, when, when you're doing these things, uh, we want to use the, the idea that when you, hear, when you hear hoofs, think horses, not zebras. Uh, uh, of course, unless you're on an African a, a safari, then I would actually think zebras, not horses. But uh, nevertheless, that, that trains us to look for the most simple solution because sometimes you just don't have to go all out to get in. Uh, social engineering is an excellent uh, example of why that is the case. We don't have to go nation state off the bat. So, I, I mean, it might be cool to use some toys like that, use the fuzz bunch stuff, but if you can get in with Hydra or a phone call to the CEO's admin assistant, I mean, that's what, that's what the malicious actors are going to do. That's what we need to focus on. So, and I, I try to relate this to the Zen of Python. And uh, if you want to play with the Zen of Python, just open up a Python interpreter and type import this. And basically uh, what it says is simple is better than complex, complex is better than complicated and readability counts. So there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the excerpt that I find to be most important with that. So there's no sense in being complicated if you don't have to. There's no sense in being complex if you don't have to. If a simple solution will work, use it. Sometimes it is a gimmicky game, but again, it's creativity and novel ways to attempt to attack or solve the problem. Because, you know, at the end of the day, these are not pen test reports. These are people learning new ways to do things. And while the storyline for things may be silly, the experience you gather with it uh, could be second to none. So some of the effective uses of uh, CTF concepts. Well, of course, bug bounties. That makes pretty good sense, wouldn't you say? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, security research, which ties in with bug bounties or other responsible disclosure type things. While Tavis Formandy is paid by Google, he does a lot of research for other, uh, against other companies' devices. Uh, to be honest, uh, if I was the point of contact for uh, a company and I saw an email come into my inbox from Tavis, I would probably um, have to run to the bathroom uh, to change my underpants because it probably wouldn't be a good day for me. Uh, it'd probably be about on the same level uh, as if uh, Brian Krebs called my PR department or my CISO and asked the same question. But 
uh, the same concepts apply in that type of stuff as well, uh, as well as purple teaming. So with this, you're trying to use the concepts in the CTFs. Basically, you can think of you can think of bug bounties as an open CTF. Basically, a company has given these people permission. Like if you are a member of this website, they have given you permission to use their stuff as a CTF in exchange for if you find anything, you tell them, you may get kudos, you may get money, you may get, may get nothing. Uh, but at least if you're doing it through a bug bounty website like Bug Crowd, as long as you follow the rules that are strictly defined to a T, you probably won't face any legal uh, repercussions. Um, but you're going to try to you're going to try to do those same concepts to try to find vulnerabilities. Um, I mean, you probably have you probably need some experience with Nmap, Burp Suite, some fuzzers. Um, you might want to take uh, some of the 101 level courses. Uh, and I'm not talking college 101. I'm just talking. 101 level courses with how to fuzz, how to use Burp Suite. I know Secure Ideas has a $25 Burp Suite course um, that you could do as well. Um, Nmap, same thing. And guess what? Where can you gain access to the experience in using these things? A CTF. Um, and the thing is, your lack of knowledge about a company because you're, you're only gonna know what the company tells you on the website and then whatever you go off and find on your own. And I honestly, taking a page from my friends who are far better pen testers than I am, taking a page from their book, they say that if at least 50% of your pen test time is not doing OSINT, you're probably doing it wrong. For this, we're not necessarily trying to gain that type of access, but it still never hurts to do some OSINT on your target. I mean, I. I think it was about two years ago, I collected a bounty for a company uh, in Asia uh, who had left some of their employees' personal information out on the web. And it was a very small file, it was a PDF. I think there was like 12 employees impacted. They paid me like a hundred bucks. So I knew nothing about the company. So I was doing OSINT on the company to see what I could find out, to see how I could leverage my way in through their website. And lo and behold, I find a PDF with this information in it. So that's you know that's something to expect uh another thing to expect uh is that you should expect to fail far more often than you succeed and while i know that especially in industry right now there's a huge uh, kind of idea that if you're a red team or you just want to beat your chest and talk about i've pwned everything i pwn you know pwn 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 and they never want to talk about solutions well this is an opportunity for you to actually restore your faith in humanity because you're trying to pwn things that aren't uh, exactly pwnable. With that being said though, if a company is doing a bug bounty through something like Bug Crowd, uh, chances are they've already got a mature security program. So you're, I mean, unless you catch it on the first day or two, you're probably not going to find a whole lot of uh, low hanging fruit. You're gonna have to work for your money. And that's why, um, I just want you to be prepared that to fail far more often than you succeed. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I don't know who the inspirational thinker is that said it, but if uh, if you've never failed, you've never tried. And uh, I know Helio Gracie, uh, one of the founders of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, he says you either win or you learn. And quite fre quite frequently, I actually learn far more than I win, and that's okay. So. Security research is the same as bug bounties, but you might have a different term, a different scope. Um, you may be doing your internal assets or you may be doing your personal assets. Uh, you may be uh, like me, uh, trying to take a certification exam and you buy the device that they tell you to uh, set up for the lab and it just so happens that it's vulnerable. That's just one example. Uh, with purple teaming, same thing. Um, and the other thing is, especially if you're in a small shop and what I mean by that is you don't have a dedicated red team or a blue team. You literally have a security team. Uh, if you ever find yourself in a position where you're not struggling to keep up and gasping for air and you have management's approval in writing, even though you're an internal employee, I still recommend getting it in writing. You could very easily ish, depending on how well you do your blue team job, 
uh, go off and attempt to exploit certain things within uh, your environment. And then because you know the exact time frame, you can look back at your events, assuming you have a SIM um, or some other log mechanism to be able to see what's going on. So you can determine what kind of events would create what. So, you know, if you do a, a SQL injection on your authentication database, um, then you can look at those events. And if it's successful, you're gonna get a lot more out of it. Uh, but it also allows uh, cross-training and innovation, which is very important. Um, that's one of those things, if I were gonna gripe about anything in industry right now, I would probably gripe about a lot of the blue team has no desire to learn anything about attacking anything or uh, methodologies. They stick to the whole uh, idea of, well, you know, you just do, you follow this framework, you do these steps and, you know, you're compliant, so you're good. Or they fall under the idea of, I don't need to know how to attack. I just need to be able to parse through my SIM. And those, those ideas are somewhat correct. But at the same time, um, you need to stay up to speed on things. And they may say, well, you know, I got this certification back in the day and it tells me that, you know, it's, it's a uh, scanning and reconnaissance footprinting um, in opposite order. Um, and then gaining access, maintaining access, clearing uh, tracks and reporting. And, and yeah, that's true. And I mean, that process, while a gross generalization is correct, it's not always the idea of what's going on. And the other idea is that everybody wants to get domain admin and beat their chest about it. Well, here's the thing, I can do just as much damage without domain admin and not be detected. I can, if I can get in, install Tor, change a password, send an email to myself and install something, I don't need domain admin. No one does. So, you know, getting away from that dichotomy, understanding what someone could do, I mean, an example of a purple team engagement you could do in the office on Monday, you could go and ask with a formal permission, of course, you could go and get someone in HR to try to send things to themselves. And I mean, you could, wherever you store your crown jewels, if this person has access to that, create a dummy file. I mean, you know, you have crownjewels.txt, create uh, jewelscrown.txt and make sure that that's what's getting sent. But send it. Another thing is you could do to assess that as well is uh, write a PowerShell or Python script to see if you can encrypt a file. If you can encrypt a file using a script, there's a good chance you're about to be susceptible to ransomware as well. So here's my story. Basically, I was starting on OSWP, which if you're not aware, is the Offensive Security Wireless Professional Certification. Uh, when you go to the website, they tell you there are certain network cards they tell you to get. Uh, I've got the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz alpha card. Uh, and then they also tell you to get uh, one of two routers because they are injectable and there are security flaws with them. Uh, this was, I did check exploit DB before I went down the rabbit hole of uh, pursuing the CVE to verify that it wasn't there and it was not. So I had just finished a Volnhub CTF. I don't remember which one it was, but I had, I had my system configured for burp. Um, and I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to configure my router. Um, so whatever. And from there, I, uh, I logged in and I started seeing things. And I was like, ooh, this is interesting. I'm going to take a look. So this is the router. It is a D-Link DER 601. It is one of the two that Offensive Security asks that people get when doing OSWP. Um, hardware version A1, firmware version 1.02 NA. Um, so let's think about what we do when we secure a router. We need to figure out what the host name is. Do we want to broadcast the SSID? What is the SSID? What kind of encryption do we want to use? Do we want to set it on a specific channel? Uh, what, what do we want to set for the key? You know, do we want to configure it over wireless? Uh, do we want to do that over HTTP or HTTPS? And I mean, a lot of these things uh, in terms of HTTP or HTTPS, okay. We know we're, we want to use HTTPS. We probably don't want to allow configuration over wireless, but for some people and some organizations that fits their threat model better. Um, encryption and the key and broadcasting SSID, same thing. We know that we should be using WPA2. We know we should be using strong keys and we know that we should, I mean, I, 
if we go by certain certifications, we should not be broadcasting the SSID, but from what I've learned taking the course associated with this, it really doesn't matter. Um, but nevertheless, you may have some hardware, uh, an old computer, you know, you might have a crotchety great uncle who's still using Windows 98, uh, whose uh, idea for using it is because it's so old, he doesn't believe anybody will attack it. And it's got his entire finance uh, stuff on it uh, from the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and he uses it because it's got a version of Quicken that he likes. Um, so with a hose like that, you honestly, you might not even be able to use wireless. In fact, you're probably not. But with a system from that same era or a little bit uh, younger than that, that, that type of host, it may not support anything but web. It may not support anything but WPA. So that's something you've got to consider because at the end of the day, in IT, we, especially in security, we are not the purveyors of no. I know we've kind of got that uh, stigma about us, but at the end of the day, we are enablers of the business. We are trying to do things to enable the business to be more secure. So with that, you know, I'll get off that soapbox and keep moving along, but all these things were configured over the web interface. So here's what I put together. After I noticed something was up, I was like, all right, I'm gonna put some fake data because I'm not about to email D-Link with my super secure password that I created with my password manager and stuff. They don't, they, they're not good enough. They don't deserve that. Um, but anyway, um, basically I named it Wireless Lab. I broadcasted, I went with WEP. Uh, that's what I set it to, channel auto. This router didn't allow an HTTPS option. So that's how I set it up. And then, oh, well, if I hadn't have given up soda, I probably would have taken a massive drink of Dr. Pepper or something bubbly uh, to create me to uh, make me expel air out my mouth so I could be punny about using the term burp. But nevertheless, anyway, here's, here's what we have for a password change. And I've highlighted everything in red. So there's the IP address up at the top, that's the default IP address. And we see it's tools underscore admin dot ask. And we see right here, it says admin password equals one, two, three, test, one, two, three, test one, more on that later. And then user password equals that, which is base 64 encoded. At the bottom, we can see right here where it says allow all for the filter. Uh, so that part's not filtered and it's allowing a remote management. So I go to log back in, cool. So there's those two boxes again. Okay, what's going on with those? Well, so I made a username and a password file and I base64 decoded them. Um, and let me just be clear, encoding is not encryption and hashing is not encryption. I will say hashing is probably more secure than encoding, but there are more secure ways to handle authentication. But remember, I said that the password I was using was 123 test, 123 test, 123. Two and three is missing. So what that's saying is that um, it only allows a 15 character password. It truncates anything after the 15th character. So what do we do? Well, like I said, I went looking through exploit DB. I went uh, doing some uh, specialized Google searches, uh, basically the same type of searches I would do uh, if I were running OSINT. Um, for CVEs, I looked at Metasploit, Dealings website, Google, um, everywhere I could think to look, I looked to see if anyone else had identified and disclosed this. And well, no one had, so I reached out to D-Link and William gets in contact with me. So basically his initial response was that, uh, you know, it's a legacy product, yeah, it's true. And that uh, it's the land side of the device, it's not the internet facing side. Yep, but he says that it's secured with encryption. Well, I, uh, I did uh, responded and said, hey, here's what I did. But, you know, saying that just because it's on the land side doesn't mean that it's not your concern because you're not going to be able to force someone to use encryption. And, you know, honestly, it's not hard for someone to run D off, especially on something like this, uh, to be able to recreate something and be able to gain access. So he basically, you know, acknowledged that it was a vulnerability and advised me that stuff was end of life and no patch was 
available. I was like, okay, that's fine. I just wanted you to know. Uh, he said that I could disclose uh, whenever I was welcome, or whenever I wanted to, um, and included that I put the specific verbiage in there. So great. Now, where do I need to go to look to get a CVE? Well, Google is not very helpful with this because when you look at CVEs, you've got uh, you've got um, CVE naming authority CNAs, and a lot of vendors are their own C, uh, CNAs, like Apple, for example. Uh, then you have uh, CERT, uh, who handles some, and then you have MITRE, who handles others. But I couldn't find a definitive thing. So basically, I had to learn how the process worked. Um, I knew what I just mentioned, and I, and I knew how to search exploit DB to see if there was a proof of concept on it. Um, so I reached out to the DEF CON 404 mailing list in Atlanta because I know there's a lot of researchers there who actually make a living from doing such types of disclosure. And one person said, go through MITRE. The other said, go through CERT. Typically, I'm not one to step down from a challenge. Uh, but in this case, uh, CERT looked easier, so I went with CERT. So CERT said, cool story, bro, but you need to go through MITRE. So I did the MITRE write-up. Uh, but the thing is, with MITRE, to get an actual CV, you have to publish it somewhere else. So I wasn't aware of where, aware of where to do that. So it's like, hmm. So I found some places. The full disclosure mailing list. Uh, there's the the uh, basically I've I've posted links to where I posted everything for the specific CVE. But then I for some things aside from my website, these are the other places that I put it. So just to make sure that no one could say that I did not disclose it publicly, I put it on the full disclosure mailing list. I did a peer list post for it. I posted it on my website, uh, GitHub. I think the only thing I really missed was Twitter. But nevertheless, I did that, and then I sent the information to MITRE, and here it is. So this is the actual CVE. It's 2018-10641. Uh, this didn't really capture everything um, that's wrong with it, but it captured enough. Um, and it was one of those things because the system is end of life and because um, they're probably not going to put any fixes out for it, I didn't feel that it was really necessary to argue back and forth with MITRE and create multiple CVEs or whatever. So um, here, here are my key, key takeaways from this. Curiosity and dumb luck go far. That, what, what I ran into with that was dumb luck based on curiosity. Not all CTFs are garbage. Not all CTFs are made of gold. Um, when you're doing these types of things, whether it be a CTF, your own independent research, a bug bounty, or whatever, you can make a difference in a product. If you get an answer that doesn't make sense, don't accept it. Continue to challenge it in a respectful manner. Um, so there was nothing formally defined uh, to have something for disclosing anything. But having a group of people like OWASP, DEF CON groups, CitySec, uh, Slack channels, uh, ISC squared, ISACA, uh, I forget what uh, CompTIA calls theirs, AITP, I think, uh, ISSA, uh, EIEIO, uh, LOPSA, and all of those. Having those at your fingertips is invaluable because while you may know more than some people on a given topic, there's always someone in there that's going to know something that you don't. And whenever you're able to interact with those people, you're going to pick up on things that uh, will make you a better professional. But then whenever you come into issues like this, you have someone to actually ask for help. And as long as you come in a humble manner and you're not trying to pwn the world or, you know, dox um, President Trump or something like that, um, most people will help you. But at the end of the day, whether it be in school, at work, uh, in one of these groups, uh, at a conference, anywhere in life, don't be afraid or intimidated to ask for help. Uh, I respect people who ask for help a lot. Uh, I hold them in a whole a lot higher uh, regard than people who are too proud to ask for help. Because at the end of the day, if someone asks me a question that I don't know the answer to, I'll be the first to tell you I don't know. I might give you, I'll tell you that, but I may follow it with, if I had to make an educated guess, here's what I would guess. Here's how I would go about searching to find out the actual answer. Would you like me to get that answer and get back to you is the way I would go about it. So, um, through the hacking glass is basically we're looking to produce training resources uh, and mentorship uh, to people 
uh, trying to advance in industry, break into industry, or change roles within industry. Uh, we're looking at a five by five model, uh, five uh, categories and five levels of difficulty, uh, which would be harden, attack, monitor, respond, analyze, and then the levels would be single system, uh, two to four systems, three to five systems, small office, home office uh, for three to five, and then um, homogenous enterprise and heterogeneous enterprise. Um, so there's a lot of building to be done with that. We definitely need lots of mentors. I think we're up to about 25 mentors and about 280 people on the list. Uh, you can be a mentor and a mentee. So just take a look at the Facebook or the Twitter for that. Um, so basically, if we think about uh, academia and certification, um, there's some overlap, but they both still lack in some places and we're trying to help fill in those blanks. Uh, my future speaking engagements, uh, if anyone is going to be in any of these areas, uh, feel free to come say hi. I'll be at B-Sides Tampa, B-Sides Huntsville, Insomniac in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, B-Sides Kansas City, and Hack in Paris. Um, I just kicked off OSINT training this morning, so I figured I'd give uh, the attendees of this a, a coupon code. So at the bottom, it's a link to a two-hour OSINT training. It's a basic OSINT um, and a coupon code if anyone wants to sign up. Uh, with that being said, uh, any questions? We've got about 10 minutes. All righty, let's see if we've got any questions coming in. All right, let's see if we've got any questions. I don't see anything on Twitter. Um, we'll see if anything comes in uh, via Twitch. But uh, great job, uh, Joe. Really appreciate you going through this whole talk and giving us a good understanding of um, how to make progress. And I really appreciated what you said about um, asking for help. Something that something I personally struggle with. It can be hard, especially when you know you're in a field or surrounded by really talented people. But um, as we've seen today, a lot of folks are willing to share what they've learned so that other people can have a leg up and not go through those same issues. So it's something to keep in mind for sure. Absolutely. I mean, together we grow. That's what it boils down to because I didn't come out of the womb and know what I know just as you didn't come out of the womb knowing what you know. I mean, there are arguments which we won't get into philosophically that we've known all this stuff all along and we just had to have it unlocked. Um, but generally speaking, you know, we learn through interacting with others, challenging ourselves and uh, doing things that uh, will make us grow. And I think things like this uh, are certainly a, a step in the right direction for that. For sure. Well, let's see, I, we've got a couple uh, things that just came in via the Twitch. So we had a question from uh, Choi Kappa who asked, on an average, how much time do you invest in a week into finding bugs? Uh, right now, given that I'm producing training, working a full-time job, writing a book and writing for Forbes, um, just in those off chances that I might find something, I'll say 0. 0.5. <laughs> um, yeah. In my, in my heyday, I would say probably uh, between 10 and 15 on a normal week, all the way up to about 40 outside of work on a heavy week. Uh, it varies. Anyone who knows me could probably attest that um, this is my passion, my hobby, and my career. So if I'm awake, chances are I'm doing something security related. <laughs> Eat, sleep, hacking. <laughs> um, all right. So our next ta ta or sorry, question was from Volton RS who asked um, an interesting question. Uh, kind of, uh, they asked, for someone that has a CCNA, what would be the next logical step to get into the security field? If you have any kind of advice for folks out there that have their Cisco certified networking associate um, or some, you know, similar sort of um, sure. certificate or degree or whatever. Absolutely. And honestly, the, the answer is pretty much yes. There's no right or wrong answer for that. It depends on what you are passionate about. So, um, if you have CCNA, you may already have enough technical chops uh, uh, to go ahead and go straight for something like, say, OSCP or OSWP if you want to go into, like, hacking and pen testing. Um, but depending on your budget, who you're working for and whatever, uh, 
uh, you may need to, it may be worthwhile to go do certified ethical hacker. And I mean, I know that they catch a lot of crap uh, for previous versions of the test and I'm not going to defend previous versions of the test. Uh, what I will say is right now I am actively enrolled in uh, an online CEH course. Um, I'm working on uh, completing it just because I've never done it. And I'm also doing it because I want to teach the class at some point. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll disclose, I do have a working relationship with EC Council. I have social engineering training that I uh, administer through EC Council. But back to the question, if you want to go more blue team, um, then it's going to be a little bit trickier. Uh, I would say um, go to chrissanders.org and take a look at some of his uh, stuff. He wrote Practical Packet Analysis, uh, Volumes 1, or uh, Editions 1 through 3. So uh, he has a lot of stuff to help you out with that so that you can learn to pick apart things and work that way if you're trying to go like the route of soccer forensics. But honestly, the best thing I can tell you is follow your passion and um, to quote System of a Down, stay smart and think dangerously. That's about the, <laughs> the best advice I could give you. Nice. I didn't expect to uh, a sewed a system of a down quote. Um, yeah, I, I would suggest I actually I started um, I took I started taking CCNA classes when I was in high school. And I, I feel like those that whole, uh, you know, experience just helps give you a great baseline um, understanding of how the internet works. And so I feel like um, a CCNA is a great, you know, platform to jump off into web hacking and all, and maybe API hacking, all kinds of stuff, because you're just going to have a better understanding of how the internet works, and and um, you're you're going to have an eye for things that others might not have if, since they don't have that background. Exactly, because the only networking certification I have is a lifetime network plus that I got in like 2009, I think. So. You know, I'm I'm not a heavy networking person. My my background before I got into security was I actually navigated submarines. And I say that and people think I'm kidding, but no, I legitimately told the officer of the deck which way to steer the boat um, where we whenever we were going places. Um, so whenever I got out using my security clearance, I went straight into an infosec role where I basically uh, was doing GRC type stuff like helping assemble uh, security documentation of packages to submit uh, for an agency in the intelligence community. But then uh, I stepped back from security for about a year and worked as a senior Unix admin uh, administering HPUX and Red Hat uh, because I'd tinkered with Linux and stuff at home a lot and I'd taken uh, some college classes on it. So, you know, if, if networking is your background, great but don't let that discourage others that may have a system administration background as well because you know when when someone says you know oh you're a hacker i mean i live in eastern tennessee i get jollies out of telling people i'm a hacker to see the look on their face and watch them try to tell me i'm about to go to prison um <laughs> and and once i once i calm them down and understand get them to understand what a hacker really is i tell them hey you know what you know what a hacker is it just means i'm a better system admin than you are I found your I found your flaws. That's all it is. It's all based on logic. So um, that's a gross generalization, but that's certainly something worth uh, using. For sure. Well, I think we addressed um, those few questions that did come in um, via the Twitch chat, and I don't see anything else on Twitter. Um, so I think we're set, Joe. Um, we had a lot of really great feedback in the chat, um, you know. Oh, actually, thanks and everything. I, I just got a question via DM. Oh, cool. We're trying to get it out in the Twitch channel, but it didn't work. Um, so uh, they wondered about full-on man hours with CTF, CTFs that proved helpful. How long did I invest as a noob? Um, I would say uh, as many as four hours a day, uh, four to five days a week. Uh, as a noob um, for CTFs that um, full amount of hours that proved helpful. Um, once you get, I, I would say anything you get on Vulnhub uh, is solid. Anything that you do on Hack the Box is solid. Hack the Box is going to be pretty hard. So I would say get comfortable with Vulnhub first. Uh, but in terms of the man hours associated with it, whatever time you can spare, you can spare whatever you can't, you know. Um, I've been fairly fortunate in a lot of my roles that I have uh, somewhat of a level of autonomy to, that I can actually go off and do CTFs and stuff 
So uh, it varies. Uh, I know specifically for the SECTF, my OSINT phase over those three weeks uh, typically ranges between 55 and 80 hours in three weeks. So, um, but it, it just depends. Like if it's something that's not going anywhere and I'm not time constrained, I'm probably not going to invest that. I'm not going to put that time of uh, time investment into it. Great. I th was there anything else that came in um, via DM? Is there anything I'm going to check as well to see if I see anything else pop up? I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Um, well, great. Um, again, everyone uh, who's watching live, thank you so much for joining us.